The Power of the Spoken Word by Florence Scovel Shin Published in 1945 Posthumously Forward Florence Scovel Shin taught metaphysics in New York for many years. Her meetings were well attended, and in that way she was the means of bringing the message to a considerable number of people. Her books have had a wide circulation, not only in America, but abroad. They seem to have a knack of finding their way to remote and unexpected places in Europe and other parts of the world. Now and again, we meet someone who came into truth through finding a Florence Shin book in the most improbable location. One secret of her success was that she was always herself, colloquial, informal, friendly, and humorous. She never sought to be literary, conventional, or impressive. For this reason, she appealed to thousands who would not have taken the spiritual message through the more conservative and dignified forms, or have been willing to read, at least in the beginning, the standard metaphysical books. She herself was very spiritual, although this was usually hidden behind a matter-of-fact and carefree treatment of her subject. The technical or academic approach was not for her. She taught by familiar, practical, and everyday examples. She had been, by profession, an artist and book illustrator before becoming a truth teacher and belonged to an old Philadelphia family. She left a collection of notes and mem memoranda which have been made into the present book. May it have a wide circulation. Emmett Fox, one of Florence Scovelshin's students. Chapter 1. Weapons Ye Know Not Of I have weapons ye know not of. I have ways ye know not of. I have channels ye know not of. Mysterious weapons, mysterious ways, mysterious channels. For God works in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. The trouble with most people is they want to know the way and the channels beforehand. They want to tell supreme intelligence just how their prayers should be answered. They do not trust the wisdom and ingenuity of God. They pray, giving infinite intelligence definite directions how to work, thereby limiting the Holy One of Israel. Jesus Christ said, When ye pray, believe ye have it. What could be more simple or direct? Become as a little child if you would enter the kingdom. We might paraphrase the, skip, the scripture and say, Have the expectancy of a little child and your prayers will be answered. A child waits with joyful expectancy for his toys at Christmas. I give the illustration of the little boy who asked for a drum for Christmas. The child does not lie awake at night agonizing over his drum, wondering, whether he will get it. He goes to bed and sleeps like a top. He jumps out of bed in the morning ready for the happy day before him. He looks with wonder at that which is before him. The grown-up person spends sleepless night agonizing over his problem. Instead of a drum, he has spoken for a large sum of money. He can't think of any way it can come, and will it come on time? He will tell you he has perfect faith in God, but he would like to know more about the channel and how it is to be done. The answer comes, I have weapons ye know not of. My ways are ingenious. My methods are sure. Trust in me. Commit your ways unto me. Committing your ways unto the Lord seems very difficult to most people. It means, of course, to follow intuition, for intuition is the magic path, the beeline to your demonstration. Intuition is a spiritual faculty above the intellect. It is the still, small voice, commonly called a hunch, which says, This is the way. Walk ye in it. 
I refer to intuition very often, for it is the most important part of spiritual development. It is divine guidance. It is the God within. It is the eye which watches over Israel and never slumbers or sleeps. With it, nothing is unimportant. Acknowledge me in all your ways, and I will make plain your path. Remember, despise not the day of small things. Remember, despise not the seemingly unimportant events. It is very difficult for a person who has always followed the reasoning mind to suddenly follow intuition, especially people who have what they call regular habits. They are accustomed to doing the same thing every day at the same time. Meals like clockwork. They get up at a certain time and go to bed at a certain time. Any deviation upsets them. We have the power of choice. We may follow the magic path of intuition or the long and hard road of experience by following the reasoning mind. By following the superconscious, we attain the heights. In the intuition are the pictures of eternal youth and eternal life where death itself is overcome. We have the power to impress the subconscious mind with the pictures of eternal youth and eternal life. The subconscious, being simply power without direction, carries out the idea, and we have our bodies transmuted into the body which can never die. We see this idea partly expressed in the moving picture, The Lost Horizon. Shangri-La was a symbolic picture of the world of the wondrous, where all conditions are perfect. There is a spiritual prototype of your body and affairs. I call it the divine design. And this divine design is a perfect idea in your superconscious mind. Most people are far from expressing the divine idea of their bodies and affairs. They have stamped the contrary pictures of disease, old age, and death upon the subconscious. And it has carefully carried out their orders. Now we must give a new order. Let me now express the divine idea in my mind, body, and affairs. If you will impress the subconscious by repeating this statement, you will be amazed at the changes which soon take place. You will be bombarded by new ideas and new ideals. A chemical change will take place in your body. Your environment will change for the better, and you are expanding rapidly into the divine plan where all conditions are permanently perfect. Lift up your heads, ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. You can substitute the word law for Lord. Lift up your heads, ye gates, and be ye lifted up ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The law, strong and mighty, the law, mighty in battle. Now remember, the Bible is talking about thoughts and states of consciousness. Here is a picture of the perfect ideas of the superconscious mind rushing into your conscious mind. Gates and doors are lifted up, and the King of glory comes in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. This King of glory has weapons ye know not of, and puts to flight the army of the aliens, those negative thoughts entrenched in your consciousness for countless ages. These negative thoughts have always defeated the manifestation of your heart's desire. They are the thought forms which you have built up in your subconscious by constantly thinking the same thoughts. You have built up a fixed idea that life is hard and filled with disappointments. You will meet these thoughts as concrete experiences in life, for out of the imaginations of the heart come the issues of life. My ways are ways of pleasantness, 
we should all build up in consciousness a picture of peace, harmony, and beauty, and some day it will push itself into visibility. The divine idea of your life often flashes across your consciousness as something too good to be true. Very few people fulfill their destinies. Destiny means the place you were destined to fill. We are fully equipped for the divine plan of our lives. We are more than equal to every situation. If we could get the realization back of these words, doors would fly open and channels be cleared. We could actually hear the hum of divine activity, for we would be linked with infinite intelligence, which knows no defeat. Opportunities would come to us from unexpected quarters. Divine activity would operate in and through all our affairs, and the divine idea would come to pass. God is love, but God is law. If ye love me, keep my commandments, or laws. Dr. Ernest Wilson told me that his first knowledge of truth came through reading Emerson's Concentration. Concentration means loving absorption. We see children lovingly absorbed in their play. We can only be a success in a line which interests us greatly. Great inventors are never bored with their work, or they would not bring forth such great inventions. Never try to force a child to be something he does not want to be. He will only prove a failure. The first start toward success is to be glad that you are yourself. So many people are bored by themselves. They have no self-reliance, and they are always wishing they were someone else. When I was in London, I saw a man on the street selling a new song. It was called, I'm Tickled to Death, I'm Me. I thought that was a wonderful idea, to start out by being glad you are yourself. Then you can expand rapidly into divine plan of your life, where you fulfill your destiny. You may be sure that the divine plan of your life will give you perfect satisfaction. You will no longer envy anyone. People often become impatient and discouraged. I was inspired by reading in the paper about Omaha, the famous racehorse. The article said, Omaha has to run a mile before he gets into his stride. There are no doubt a lot of Omahas in the world but they can get into their spiritual stride and win the race in the twinkling of an eye. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Delight thyself in the law, and it will give to thee the desires of thine heart. Delighting yourself in the law means to enjoy making a demonstration, to enjoy trusting God, means to be happy in following your intuitive leads. Most people say, oh dear, I've got to demonstrate money again. Or, oh dear, my hunches make me so nervous, I haven't the nerve to follow them. People enjoy playing golf and tennis. Why can't we also enjoy playing the game of life? It is because we are playing with unseen forces. With golf or tennis, they have balls they can see and a goal which is visible to the naked eye. But how much more important is this game of life? The goal is the divine plan of your life where all conditions are permanently perfect. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will make plan plain thy path. Every moment we can link with intuition and give us as definite a lead as a signpost. So many people are leading such complicated lives because they are trying to think things out instead of intuiting the way out. I know a woman who says she has a thorough knowledge of truth and its applications. But the minute she has a problem, she reasons and weighs and measures the situation. It is never solved. Intuition flies out the window when reason comes to the door. Intuition is a spiritual faculty, the superconscious, and never explains itself. There came a voice before me, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. Someone asked me if the reasoning mind was ever any good. The reasoning mind must be redeemed. Trust in spiritual law 
and it will be given you. Your part is to be a good receiver. Prepare for your blessing, rejoice, and give thanks, and it will come to pass. I have weapons ye know not of. I have ways which will astound you. Chapter 2 I give unto you power. God's gift to us is power. Power and dominion over all created things, our mind, our bodies, and our affairs. All unhappiness comes from lack of power. Man imagines himself weak and the victim of circumstances, claiming that conditions over which he had no control caused his defeat. Man by himself is indeed a victim of circumstances, but linked with God power, all things are possible. Through a knowledge of metaphysics, we are discovering how this can be done. By your word, you contact this power. Then, miraculously, every burden is lifted and every battle is won. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Watch your words with all diligence. You are continually reaping the fruits of your words. And he that overcometh and keepeth my words to the end, to him will I give power and dominion over the nations. Overcoming means to conquer all doubts, fears, and negative vibrations. One man with perfect peace and perfect poise, filled with love and good will, could dissolve all negative vibrations. They would melt away like snow under the sun. Jesus Christ said, All power is given unto me to bring heaven upon earth. Let us give thanks that this is now coming to pass. For evil is unreal and leaves no stain. This God power is within you, your superconscious mind. It is the realm of inspiration, revelation, and illumination. It is the realm of miracles and wonders. Quick and seemingly impossible changes take place for your good. A door opens where there were no doors. Sure, supply appears from hidden and unexpected channels for God has weapons ye know not of. To work with God power, you must give it right of way and still the reasoning mind. The instant you ask, infinite intelligence knows the way of fulfillment. Man's part is to rejoice and give thanks and act his faith. A very well-known woman in England told of this experience. She was asking with great feeling for a realization of God. These words came to her, act as though I were, and I am. It is exactly what I say over and over again. Only active faith impresses the subconscious, and unless you impress the subconscious, there are no results. I will now give you an example to show you just how this law works. A woman came to me whose heart's desire was her right marriage and happy home. She was very fond of a certain man, but he was a most difficult person. After having shown her every attention and devotion, he suddenly changed and dropped out of her life. She was unhappy, resentful, and discouraged. I said, now this is the time to prepare for your happy home. Buy little things for it as if you hadn't a minute to spare. She became quite interested in shopping for her happy home, where all appearances were against it. Now, I said, you'll have to perfect yourself on this situation and become immune to all resentment and unhappiness. I gave her the statement, I am now immune to all hurt and resentment. My poise is built upon a rock, the Christ within. I said, when you are immune to all hurt and resentment, this man will be given you or his equivalent. It took many months when one evening she came to see me and said, I have only the kindest and most friendly feelings for this man. If he isn't the divine selection, I would be happy without him. Not long after, she happened to meet the man. He was so sorry for the way he had acted. He begged her to forgive him. Not long after, they were married, and a happy home came into manifestation. It had built itself around her act of faith. 
Your only enemies are within yourself. The woman's enemies were hurt and resentment. They are indeed serpents, serpents and scorpions. Many lives have been wrecked by these two enemies. Linked with God power, all opposition vanished from this woman's life. Nothing could by any means hurt her. Think what that means to have a life free from all unhappy experiences. It is done through making a conscious contact with God power every instant. Many times in the Bible the word power is mentioned. Thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. A person with a rich consciousness attracts riches. A person with a poor consciousness attracts poverty. I have seen people in this truth rise out of lack and limitation by linking with the God power within, not depending on the external, trusting in God who gives you irresistible power, for this supreme intelligence only knows the way of fulfillment. Trust in me, and I will bring it to pass. All our knowledge of truth can bring us is to know that God is the only power. One power, one presence, one plan. When you have the fixed idea that there is only one power in the universe, God power, all appearance of evil will disappear from your world. In getting a demonstration, we must acknowledge only one power. Evil comes from man's own vain imagings. Withdraw all power from evil, and it is powerless to hurt. I will give you an example which shows the working of the law. I was in a restaurant with a friend who spilled something on her dress. She was sure it would leave a stain. I said, we'll give it a treatment. I made the statement, evil is unreal and leaves no stain. I said, now don't look, leave it to in infinite intelligence. In about an hour, we took a look and there was not the slightest stain. What is, tr what is true for a little thing is true of a big thing. You can use this statement for past misfortunes or mistakes, and somehow or another under grace the effects will disappear. They will leave no stain. Many people are using personal power instead of God power, which always brings unhappy reactions. Personal power means forcing personal will. I will give the example of a woman I knew a long time ago. She married a man who worked on a newspaper drawing a comic strip. His drawings demanded a knowledge of slang, which he, could use, which he used on every occasion. She decided he should cultivate his mind and read the classics. They moved to a college town so that he could go to college. She insisted upon his going to college. He resisted a little at first, then he grew to like it. Soon he was steeped in the classics. He wouldn't talk anything but Plato and Aristotle. He wanted the food cooked the way they cooked and eat the simple food they ate. Her life had become a nightmare. After that, she never tried to change people. The only person to change is yourself. As you change, all the conditions around you will change. People will change. When you are undisturbed by a situation, it falls away of its own weight. Your life is outpictured by the sum total of your subconscious beliefs. Wherever you go, you take these conditions with you. I am strong in the Lord and the power of his might. I am backed by unnumbered hosts of power. Power means dominion and dominion means control. Humans control conditions by a knowledge of spiritual law. Suppose your problem is lack or limitation. Your urgent need is supply. Link with this God power within and give thanks for your immediate supply. If you are too close to the situation, if you are filled with doubts and fears, go to a practitioner for help, someone to see clearly for you. A man told me while at a truth center at Pittsburgh, he heard people talking about me and he said, who in the heck is Florence Scovel Shin? 
Somebody replied, oh, she wrote the game of life. If you write to her, she'll get you a miracle. He said he promptly wrote to me and got a demonstration. Jesus Christ said, when two of you agree, it shall be done. Do not hesitate to ask for help if you cannot see clearly for your good. Jesus Christ saw clearly for the people he healed. He did not tell them to heal themselves. Of course, you can reach the state where you do not need any help. When you have the fixed idea that God's power is the only power and that God's plan is the only plan. We cannot take blessings from infinite intelligence. They must be given us. Man's part is to be a grateful receiver. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, and hath put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the fields. This is God's idea of man, but man's idea of himself is one of limitation and failure. It is only in a big moment that man seems to rise to his power and dominion. It isn't until we face a situation of lack that we suddenly express the power which has already been given us. I have known people who are usually nervous and anxious to, to become poised and powerful when confronted by a big situation. Hear, O Israel, ye have no need to fight. Stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord. People often ask, what does it mean to stand still, to do nothing at all? Standing still means to keep your poise. I said to a man who is tense and anxious, Take it easy and see the salvation of the Lord. He replied, My, that has helped me a lot. Most people are trying too hard. They carry their burdens and fight their battles and are, therefore, always in a turmoil and never get what we call a demonstration. Stand aside and see the salvation of the Lord. We might paraphrase the scriptures and say, Hear, O Israel, you will never win this battle by fighting. Leave it entirely to me, and it will be given you. Following the magic path of intuition, you escape all complications and frictions and make a beeline to your demonstration. Remember, we are told not to despise the day of small things. It is a great mistake to think that anything is unimportant. I was going to a shop to buy two articles. In my vicinity are two shops, an expensive one, and one where all the things are a little cheaper, but the articles are exactly the same. The reasoning mind said, go to the cheaper place, but intuition said, Go to the expensive place. Of course I followed my intuition. I told the clerk what I wanted. He said, The two articles are today sold for the price of one, because they are advertising one of the products. So intuition led me to the right place and the right price. The difference in price was only about 50 cents, but intuition always looks after our interest. If I had been trying to get something cheap, I would have gone to the other shop and paid twice as much. Learn from the little things, and you will be ready to handle the big things. Studying closely the scriptures, we find God's gift to man is power. The things and conditions automatically follow. God gives man power to get well. He gives man power over the elements. He gives man power to heal sickness and to cast out devils. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings and eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and shall walk and not faint. Let us realize that this invincible power is within reach of all. Whosoever calleth on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. So we find the word links man with omnipotence. The supreme intelligence is more than equal to lifting every burden and fighting every battle. All power is given unto me 
to bring my heaven upon my earth. Chapter 3 Be Strong, Fear Not Be strong, fear not. Fear is man's only adversary. You face defeat whenever you are fearful. Fear of lack, fear of failure, fear of loss, fear of personality, fear of criticism. Fear robs you of all power, for you have lost your contact with the universal powerhouse. Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Fear is inverted faith. It is faith turned upside down. When you are fearful, you begin to attract the very thing you fear. You are magnetizing it. You are hypnotized by that thought when you are afraid. Daniel was undisturbed because he knew his God was stronger than the lions. His God made the lions as harmless as kittens. So walk up to your lion as quickly as possible and see for yourself. Perhaps all your life you've been running away from some particular lion. It has made your life miserable and perhaps your hair gray. A hairdresser once told me that she knew a woman whose gray hair returned to its natural color when the woman stopped worrying. Another woman said to me during an interview, I'm not a bit fearful, but I do worry a lot. But fear and worry are twins and they're the same thing. If you were fearless, your worry cells would be tried up. Why are ye worried, O ye of little faith? I think the most prevalent fear is the fear of loss. Perhaps you have everything that life can give, but in creeps the old lion of apprehension. You hear him growling. It's too good to be true. It can't last. If he gets your attention, you may well worry. Many people have lost what they prized most dearly in life. That is because invariably they fear loss. The only weapon you can use against your lions is your word. Your word is your wand, filled with magic and power. You wave your wand over your lion and transmute him into a kitten. But the lion will remain a lion unless you walk up to him. You may well ask, how do we walk up to lions? Moses said unto his people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you this day. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. What a marvelous arrangement! Infinite intelligence knows the way out. Infinite intelligence knows where the supply is for every demand, but we must trust it, keep our poise and give it the right of way. So many people are afraid of other people. They run away from disagreeable situations. So of course, the situation runs after them. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The 27th Psalm is one of the most triumphant psalms. It is also rhythmic and musical. The writer realized that no enemy could harm him, for the Lord was his light and his salvation. Now, remember your enemies are within yourself. The Bible is speaking of the enemy thoughts, your doubts, fears, hates, resentments, and forebodings. Every negative situation in your life is a crystallized thought. It has been built up out of your own vain imaginings. But these situations cannot stand the light of truth. So you face the situation fearlessly saying, the Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Jesus Christ was the greatest of metaphysicians and gave us definite rules for controlling conditions through word and thought. Thou hast made me wiser than mine enemies. First of all, you must be wiser than your enemy thoughts, the army of aliens. You must answer every negative thought with a word of authority. The army of the aliens will chant, business is dull and money is scarce. Immediately you reply, my supply comes from God and now appears like mushrooms overnight. There are no hard times in the kingdom. 
you may have to keep this up for quite a while. Like the song of the Katydids. Katie did, Katie didn't, and so on. Finally, you went out. For the truth must prevail, and you have put to flight the army of the aliens. Then, when you are off your guard, the army of the aliens begins again. You are not appreciated. You'll never be a success. You answer immediately, God appreciates me, therefore man appreciates me. Nothing can interfere with my divinely designed success. Finally, the army of the aliens is dissolved and dissipated because you do not give it your attention. You have starved the aliens out. Starve out the fear thoughts by not giving them your attention and acting your faith. The lion draws his fear fierceness from your fear. His roar is in the tremors of your heart. Stand still like Daniel, and you too shall hear the rush of angels sent to take your part. The mission of Jesus Christ was to wake people up. Awake thou that sleepeth. People were asleep in the edemic dream of opposites. Lack, loss, failure, sin, sickness, and death seemed realities to them. The story of Adam is that he ate of the tree of illusion and fell into a deep sleep. In his deep sleep, he vainly imagined good and evil. Bernard Shaw, in his book, Back to Methuselah, says, Adam invented murder, birth and death, and all negative conditions. It was the development of the reasoning mind. Of course, Adam stands for generic mind. In the Garden of Eden stage, man functioned only in the superconscious. Whenever he desired or required, it was always at hand. With the development of the reasoning mind came the fall of man. He reasoned himself into lack, limitations, and failure. He earned his bread by the sweat of his brow, instead of being divinely provided for. Jesus Christ's message was to bring people back into the fourth dimension, the Garden of Eden consciousness. In the fourteenth chapter of John, we find the summing up of all his teachings. He called it the Gospel, which means good tidings. With amazing simplicity and directness, he told the people that if they asked, believing, they would receive, attributing the power always to the Father within. God is the giver, man the receiver. The supreme intelligence supplies man with all that he desires or requires. This was certainly a doctrine to wake people up. He proved his statements with miracles and wonders. One of the most dramatic miracles was the healing of the man who had been blind from birth. The opponents of Jesus questioned the man, hoping to find something against him. But the man would only say, One thing I know, whereas I was blind, now I can see. This is a marvelous statement to make to yourself. Whereas I was blind, now I can see. Perhaps you were blind to your good, blind to your opportunities, blind to your intuitive leads, blind to appearances, mistaking friends for enemies. When you are awake to your good, you know there are no enemies, for God utilizes every person and situation for your good. Hindrances are friendly and obstacles are stepping stones. One with God, you become invincible. This is a powerful statement. God's invincible power sweeps all before it. I ride the waves into my promised land. Riding the waves, they take you to your destination, free from the undertow of negative thinking, which will pull you down. Your thoughts and desires are always taking you somewhere. Prentice Mulford said, The persistent purpose, that strong desire, that never-ceasing longing, is a seed in the mind. It is rooted there. It is alive. It never stops growing. There is a wonderful law involved in it. This law, when known, followed out and trusted, leads every individual to mighty and beautiful results. The law followed with our eyes open leads to more and more happiness in life, but followed blindly with our eyes shut leads to misery. This means that desire is a tremendous vibratory force and must be rightly directed. 
take this statement. I only desire that which infinite intelligence desires through me. I claim that which is mine by divine right and under grace in a perfect way. You will then cease desiring the wrong things, and the right things will take their place. Your dreary desires are answered drearily. Your impatient desires are long delayed or violently fulfilled. It is important never to lose sight of this. Many unhappy situations have been brought about through dreary or impatient desires. I will give an example of a woman who was married to a man who wanted her to go somewhere with him every evening. It wore her out, and night after night she wished impatiently that she could stay home and read a book. The desire was so strong it commenced to bud. Her husband went off with another woman. She lost him and his support, but she had the time to stay at home and read a book. Nothing has ever come uninvited into your life. Prentice Mulford has also some interesting ideas on work. He said, to succeed in any undertaking, any art, or any trade, or any profession, simply keep it ever persistently fixed in mind as an aim, and then study to make all effort toward it, play or recreation. The moment it becomes hard work, we are not advancing. As I look back on my experiences in the art world, I see how true this is. From the Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia came eight men, all of about the same age, who became distinguished and successful artists. They were called the eight in contemporary art. No one of them was ever known to work hard. They never drew from the antique. They never did anything in an academic way. They simply expressed themselves. They painted and drew because they loved it. For the fun of it. They tell an amusing story of one of them who became very well known as a landscape artist, taking many medals and honorary mentions at exhibits. He had a one-man show in New York City at one of the big galleries and was seated reading a paper. An enthusiastic woman rushed up to him and said, can you tell me anything about the wonderful man who painted these adorable pictures? He replied, sure, I'm the guy that painted the damn things. He painted for fun. He didn't care whether people liked his pictures or not. Whereas I was blind, now I can see my right work, my perfect self-expression. Whereas I was blind, now I can see clearly and distinctly the divine plan of my life. Whereas I was blind, now I can see that God's power is the only power and that God's plan is the only plan. The thought is still with the belief in insecurity, awaketh thou that sleepeth. God is your eternal security of mind, body, and affairs. Let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. If you were wide awake to your good, you could not be troubled and fearful. Waking up to the truth that there is no loss, lack, or failure in the kingdom of reality, loss, lack, and failure would disappear from your life. They come from your own vain imaginings. The following is an example illustrating the working of the law. A number of years ago when I was in London, I bought a wonderful fountain pen at Asprey's. It was Japanese and it was called a Namiki pen. It was quite expensive and they gave me with it a guarantee that it would last 30 years. I was very much impressed because every summer on the 5th of July, they wrote me asking how the pen was getting along. One might have thought I had bought a horse. It was no ordinary pen and was very satisfactory. I always carried it with me and one day I lost it. I immediately commenced denying the loss. I said, there is no loss in divine mind. Therefore, I cannot lose the Namiki pen. It will be restored to me or its equivalent. No shops that I knew of in New York City carried those pens, and London was a long way off. But I was charged with divine confidence. I could not lose the Namiki pen. One day, going along Fifth Avenue in a bus, my eye caught a sign on a shop for, the, for a fraction of a second. It seemed to stand out in the light. It read, Oriental Craft Shop. I had never heard of it, but I had a strong hunch to go in and ask for a Namiki pen. I got off the bus and went into the shop and asked. The saleswoman replied, Why, yes, we have quite an assortment. 
they have just been reduced to $2.50. I praised the Lord and gave thanks. I bought three and told the above story at one of my meetings. They were soon sold out as people rushed to get them. This was certainly an amazing working of the law, but I was wide awake to my good. I did not let any grass grow under my intuitive lead. The truth student knows he must prove the principle in his everyday affairs. Acknowledge me in all your ways, and I will direct your paths. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. What wonderful faith Jesus Christ had in man! He held the vision of the race to come. The man made in God's likeness and image, and who whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it, he explained to the people that were there under a system of gifts. God was the giver, man the receiver. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. He told people to seek the kingdom, the realm of perfect ideas, where all things would be added unto them. He woke them up. Whereas I was blind, now I can see. There is nothing to fear, there is nothing to fear for there is no power to hurt. I see clearly before me the open road of fulfillment. There are no obstacles on my pathway. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hand. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Psalm 8, 6. Chapter 4. The Glory of the Lord. In the dictionary, I find the word glory defined as radiance, splendor. Mine eyes have seen the radiance of the Lord. That means the law in action. We cannot see God, for God is principle, power, the supreme intelligence within us. But what we see are the proofs of God. Prove thou me herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the window of hearing and pour you out a blessing so great there be not room enough to receive it. We prove God by directing God power and trusting in it to do the work. Every time we get a demonstration, we have proved God. If you have not received the, the desires of your heart, you have asked amiss. That is, you have not prayed aright. You receive your answer in the same way in which you send out your demand. Your dreary desires are answered drearily. Your impatient desires are long delayed or violently fulfilled. Suppose you are resenting lack and limitation and living in poor surroundings. You say with great feeling, I want to live in a big house with beautiful surroundings. Sooner or later you may find yourself a caretaker in a big and beautiful house, but you will have no share in this opulence. This idea came to me as I was passing Andrew Carnegie's house and grounds on Fifth Avenue. It was all closed, and the entrance and windows boarded up. There was just one window open in the basement. This is where the caretaker lived. It was certainly a dreary picture. So ask, or wish, with praise and thanksgiving, so that you will see the glory of the law in action. All life is vibration. You combine with what you notice, or you combine with what you vibrate to. If you are vibrating to injustice and resentment, you will meet it on your pathway at every step. You will certainly think it is a hard world and that everybody in it is against you. Hermes Trimagistus said several thousand years ago, To change your mood, you must change your vibrations. I make it even stronger. I say, to change your world, you must change your vibrations. Turn on a different current in your battery of thought, and you'll see the difference immediately. Suppose you have been resenting people and saying you are not appreciated. Take the statement, God appreciates me, therefore man appreciates me, I appreciate myself. Immediately you will meet with some recognition on the external. 
You are now a master workman and your tools are your words. Be sure you are building constructively according to the divine plan. Judge Troward said, Man is a distributor of God power. He does not create this force. We find in Hebrews, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visited him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, and hath crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Thou hast put all things under our understanding. We are now coming into an understanding age. We no longer have the faith of peasants. We have understanding faith. Solomon said, With all your getting, get understanding. Understanding of the working of the spiritual law, so that we distribute this power within us in a constructive way. The law of laws is to do unto others as you would be done by, for whatever you send out comes back, and what you do to others will be done to you. So the woman who refrains from criticizing saves herself from criticism. Critical people are always criticized. They are living in that vibration. They also have rheumatism, for acid thoughts produce acid in the blood, which causes pain in the joints. I read an article in the newspaper. It said a physician had a peculiar experience with one of his patients. The woman had boils every time her mother-in-law paid a visit. There is nothing peculiar in this, as she was boiling within. How many times have we heard people say they were in a boiling rage? So the boils appeared on her body. This does not include all mothers-in-law. I have known some very wonderful ones who have brought only peace and harmony with them. Skin troubles show that someone has got under your skin. You have been irritated or angered. Here we see again that man gives direction to this God power through himself. Vibrate to this power. All things are under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, the beast of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, whatsoever passes through the paths of the seas. What a picture of power and dominion for us. We have power and dominion over the elements. We should be able to rebuke the wind and the waves. We should be able to put an end to drought. I read in the paper that the people in a certain drought district were requested not to sing. It ain't going to rain no more. Knowing something of metaphysics, they realized the power of negative words. They felt it had something to do with the drought. We should be able to stop floods and epidemics, for man is given power and dominion over all created things. Every time we get a demonstration, we are proving our power and dominion. We must be lifted up in consciousness for the King of glory to come in. As we read the statement, If thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. We seem flooded with an inner radiance. The single eye means to see good only, to be undisturbed by appearances of evil. As Jesus Christ said, Judge not by appearances, judge righteous judgment. There is an occult law of indifference. Jesus Christ knew this law. None of these things move me. None of these things disturb me, we might say in our modern language. Selfishness and personal will bring defeat and failure. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. The imagining faculty is a creative faculty, and your fear pictures will appear on the external, the result of your own distorted imagination. With a single eye, man sees only the truth. He sees through evil, knowing out of it comes good. He transmutes injustice into justice and disarms his seeming enemies by sending goodwill. He is now backed by the unnumbered host of power. For the single eye sees only victory. We read in mythology of the Cyclops, a race of giants said to have inhabited Sicily.
These giants had only one eye in the middle of their forehead. The seat of the imagining faculty is situated in the forehead, between the eyes. So these fabled giants came from this idea. You are indeed a giant when you have the single eye. Jesus Christ, the greatest of all teachers, reiterated, Now is the appointed time. Today is the day of your salvation. A few days ago, I saw a motion picture which featured the futility of trying to live in or bring back the past. It was a French picture and was called Life Dances On. It was the story of a woman who, when 16, had gone to her first ball. She is now a widow of about 35. She had married for money and had never known happiness. When burning old papers, she came across a faded dance program. On it were the names of six men she had danced with at the ball. Each had sworn to love her all his life. As she sits with the program in her hands, the memory of the ball is pictured on the screen. A scene of loveliness, the dancers almost floating to the strains of an entrancing waltz. Her life is now empty, and she decides to recover her lost youth by finding out what had become of the men whose names were on the program. A friend of her says, You cannot recapture your lost youth. If you go back, you lose the things of today. However, she goes in search of them, and, with all, comes to disillusion. One did not remember her at all. When she said, Don't you remember me? I am Christine. He replied, Christine who? Some of them were living sordid lives. At last she returns to the town of her girlhood, where the fifth man lived. He had become a hairdresser. He talks to her gaily of old times, while he gives her a permanent wave. He says, I don't suppose you remember your first ball. It was right here in this town, and tonight there will be a dance in the same place. Do come with me. It will remind you of the old days. She goes to the ball. Everything looks cheap and tawdry. Unattractive, badly dressed people are on the dance floor. She requests the orchestra to play her waltz, the waltz of her lost youth. Her escort tells the others that they won't like such an old-fashioned waltz. However, they play it. The contrast is too much. All her illusions have vanished. She realizes the ball she remembers never really existed the way she thought it did. It was only an illusion of the past. She could not recapture her past. It has been said that the two robbers on the cross stood for the robbers of time. One spoke of the past and one of the future, and Jesus Christ replied, Now is the appointed time. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. In the old Sanskrit poem we are told, Look well, therefore, to this day. Such is the salutation of the dawn. All worry and fears are robbers of time. The occult law underlying indifference is one of the most profound, for it contains the attainment of a state of consciousness in which the outer world of sensation has no influence upon the action of the mind, and it can, therefore, be incomplete at one meant or atonement with the divine mind. Most people's lives are a succession of disturbances, lack, loss, limitation, mothers-in-laws, landlords, debt, injustice. The world was popularly known as a veil of tears. People were all mixed up in their own affairs, fighting their battles and carrying their burdens. If a man judges by appearances, he finds himself in an, are finds himself in an arena most of the time the arena of adverse conditions and facing lions of lack and limitation. If thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. In other words, if you are imagining adverse conditions, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? The light of the body is the inner eye. If, therefore, thine eye be single, you are seeing only one power, one plan, and one planner. Your body and affairs will be full of light. See yourself daily bathed in the light of the Christ. 
This inner radiance is invincible power and dissolves everything not divinely planned. It dissolves all appearance of disease, lack, loss, or limitation. It dissolves adverse conditions or any weapon that is formed against you. We have always at our command this light when your eye is single. We should learn to, to turn on this light with the same assurance with which we turn on the electric light. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all right things shall be added unto you. The Chinese proverb says, The philosopher leaves the cuff of his coat to the tailor. So, leave the plan of your life to the divine planner, and you will find all conditions permanently perfect. Chapter 5. Peace and Prosperity Peace be within thy walls and pr prosperity within thy palaces. In this statement from the 122nd Psalm, we find that peace and prosperity go hand in hand. People who are manifesting the appearance of lack are in the state of fear and confusion. They are not wide awake to their good and miss leads and opportunities. A peaceful person is a wide awake person. He or she sees clearly and acts quickly. He or she never misses a trick. I have seen people discordant and unhappy changed completely. I will give an example in order to prove the working of the law. A woman came to me in a state of abject sorrow. She looked the part. Her eyes were blurred from constant weeping. Her face was haggard and drawn. The man she loved had left her, and she was certainly the most demagnetized creature I had ever seen. I noticed the shape of her face, large eyes, far apart, and a pointed chin. For many years I was an artist, and, I, and have got into the habit of looking at people from an artist's standpoint. As I looked at this forlorn creature, I thought, her face has the modeling of a Botticelli. I often see Rembrandts, Sir Joshua Reynolds, etc. in people I meet. I spoke the word to this woman and gave her my book, The Game of Life and How to Play It. A week or two afterwards, in walked a very dashing person. Her eyes were beautiful and she was very pretty. I thought her face has the modeling of a Botticelli. Suddenly I realized it was the same woman. She was happy and carefree. What had happened? Our talk and the book had brought her peace. Peace be within your walls. Your walls are your consciousness. Jesus Christ emphasized peace and rest. Come to me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He was speaking of the Christ within, your superconscious mind, where there are no burdens and no battles. The doubts and fears and negative pictures are the subconscious. When I was returning from California some years ago, I came in on an airplane. In the high altitudes, I had a queer detached feeling. In that high altitude, we are at peace with ourselves and with the whole world. In the high altitudes, the fields are always white with the harvest. Only the emotions keep you from reaping your harvest of success, happiness, and abundance. We read in the Bible, I will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. We might well paraphrase it and say, I will restore to you the years the emotions have ruined. People are rocked with doubts and fears, bringing failure, unhappiness, and disease. I read in a daily paper that the laws of the mind are being generally recognized and understood. It has been found that the fear of failure is the greatest of all fears, and at least 75% of those examined psychologically have this failure fear. Of course, this may refer to failure of health, failure in business, finances, love, success, etc. Other important fears are fear of the dark, fear of being alone, fear of animals. Some people fear they will be misunderstood, while others fear they are losing mental control. Constant and continued fear affects the glands, interferes with digestion, and is usually associated with distressing nervous systems. It robs the body of health and destroys happiness. Fear is man's worst enemy, for you attract what you fear. It is faith turned upside down. It is really faith in evil, 
instead of faith in good. Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? The fearless, unfettered mind attracts to itself all good. Whatever you desire or require is already on your pathway. Before ye call, I have answered. Suppose we paraphrase the scriptures and say, whatever you desire or require is already planted on your pathway. Often a new word will give you a sudden realization. If you are in need of any information, it will be given you. A friend told me of this surprising working of the law. She was translating an old Italian manuscript on the life of an early Persian ruler. No books in English had been written on the subject. She wondered why the publishers were holding back its publication. One evening, she was eating her dinner at the automat. She fell into a conversation with a man at the same table. She told him of the work she was doing and of the translation of the early Italian manuscript. He suddenly volunteered the information. You'll have a hard time getting it published because this Persian ruler's ideas conflict with the ideas of the present government. He was a student and scholar and knew more than she did on the subject. Her question was answered and at the automat. Such information could usually be gleaned only in the archives of some public library. God works in unexpected places, his wonders to perform. She had worried about it, but when she was peaceful and happy and unconcerned, the information sailed in over a calm sea. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem stands for peace and the feet for understanding. So understanding always brings us within the gates of peace. How can a person attain peace when his whole life is in turmoil? By taking an affirmation. You cannot control your thoughts, but you can control your words, and eventually the word wins out. Most people have attracted inharmonious conditions because they have been fighting their battles and carrying their burdens. We must learn to get out of God's way so that he can harmonize or adjust the situation. The word harmonize is a very good one, for I have seen crooked places made straight and adjustments made that no human mind could have thought of. All that the kingdom affords is yours if you will give infinite intelligence the right of way, for it has already supplied a lavish supply for every demand. But it must be fully trusted. If you are filled with doubts and fears, it is necessary to do something to show your faith. Faith without works, or action, is dead. Active faith impresses the subconscious with expectancy, and you keep your contact with universal intelligence. Just as Wall Street watches the market, we must watch our faith mar market. Often the faith market is down. Sometimes it goes down and down until a crash comes, some unhappy situation which we could have prevented. We realize we followed reason instead of intuition. A woman told me how she had several definite leads not to follow a certain course. In spite of this, she followed the reasoning mind and great unhappiness developed from it. Intuition is our unerring guide. Practice following it in little things, and you will trust it in big things. I have a friend who is very intuitive. She sometimes calls up and says, I've just had a hunch to call you up, so I thought I would find out what it is about. Invariably, I have some mission for her. We are indeed living magic lives, guided, protected, and provided for. All fear would be banished forever with the realization of this amazing system the Universal has provided for us. We would be unmoved by adverse appearances, knowing, as the early Hebrews knew, that Jehovah goes before and every battle is won. A friend told me a very interesting story. A man in the paper business in Kalamazoo, Michigan, had given away a thousand of my books to his employees. He went into business on a small capital and gave up cold judgment and reasoning. He has built up $12 million business by following leads and hunches. All his workers have a knowledge of metaphysical law. Another man who built his business upon the law of giving and receiving met with the same amazing success.
he came to Philadelphia with a little money and bought a magazine, an old publication. His desire was to give the people a great deal for a very small price. He believed in the law of giving. It proved to be one of the most popular magazines. He gave the public the best in the way of stories and illustrations and paid well for them. The more he gave, the more he received. Millions poured in. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. Peace and prosperity go hand in hand. Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. This law is the law of non-resistance. Resist not evil, overcome evil with good. Transmute all failure into success, lack into plenty, and discord into peace. Chapter 6. Your Big Opportunity You have only one judge, your word. Jesus Christ said, I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment, for by the wor thy word thou shalt be justified, and by thy word thou shalt be condemned. Every day is a day of judgment. We used to be taught that it would be at the end of the world. Look back in your life and see how you have attracted either happiness or disaster through your words. The subconscious has no sense of humor. People joke destructively about themselves, and the subconscious takes it seriously. It is because the mental picture you make while speaking impresses the subconscious and works out on the external. A person who knows the power of the word becomes very careful of his conversation. He has only to watch the reaction of his words to know that they do not return void. People make their worst mistakes by speaking while they are angry or resentful because there is so much ill feeling back of their words. Owing to the vibratory power of words, what you voice, you begin to attract. People who continually speak of disease invariably attract disease. Invisible forces are ever working for man who is always pulling the string. Wait, was she perfectly well? By your word, you are justified, and by your word, you are condemned. I knew a man who was the center of attraction wherever he went because he was always enthusiastic about something. Whether it was about shoes, clothes, or a haircut, he enthused others into buying the same things. He did not gain anything material by it. He was just naturally enthusiastic. Someone had said, if you want to be interesting to others, be interested in something. An interested person is an enthusiastic person. We often hear people say, do tell me what you're interested in. Many people are without vital interest. As we read this, we feel the enthusiasm of the multitudes which surrounded him. With him, all things were possible, for he knew that he and the Father were indeed one. With divine enthusiasm, I bless what I have and look with wonder at their increase. The End